one last question, and that was in the case that you cited, it clearly says Which case? I'm sorry. in Witten, Witten? Whitworth versus State, it clearly says the prosecutor should see no unfair advantage in taking advantage of the accused. That creates the conflict. What unfair advantage has he done in this case? And you've asked me a lot of questions about Whitworth. I would love a chance to read it if you have a few minutes just so I can actually respond. I don't have it in front of me, and there's a lot of cases out there, and I want to make sure I respond accurately. Sure, I have it. Okay. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just, I'm one of those people on visual. I like to see it. <laughs> Do you mind? You it down to Thank it. you. While she's looking at this, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Uh, I wanted to let the public know how you can get information to us. Each senator on the committee has a separate email address for committee business, and it's simply the last name of the senator. In my case, it would be calcert.inv at senate.ga.gov. INV, obviously, for investigation committee. So each senator, their last name, dot INV at senate.ga.gov. And David Cook is sitting over here in the corner as the secretary of the Senate. He is going to be the safekeeper of any documents or evidence that we accumulate. His email address for this purpose will be cook.inv at senate.ga.gov. I've had a number of uh, citizens that have reached out and wanted to provide information or be heard or, or you know, uh, testify possibly in front of this committee. And uh, we are encouraging anybody that has input or information that might be helpful to us to provide it to a committee member, ideally to cook.inv at senate.ga.gov because Secretary Cook will provide it to all committee members. We don't have a uh, next meeting scheduled yet, but it will be uh, no more than a couple of weeks away. Ms. Merchant, you may not be able to have completed your testimony today, and we may have to call you back for additional uh, questioning after today, but you, I'm not rushing. Take your time, read that. Can it not opinion. be the first week of April? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cobb County spring break, please. <laughs> That'd be fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm so glad. I. So this is um, Morgan. When you said Morgan, it didn't. It should have. J. Tom. Um, it should have struck with me. I remember this now. So this case. Um, he. So J. Tom was actually the district attorney when he first took this case, and he was not. No, don't talk. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the microphone. I'm not good at that. Sorry. Um, he took employment later on. So the employment. So it's, it's different than our case um, because he took employment later on. He wasn't actually paid hourly. Um, he was a member of Prosecuting Attorneys Council, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one thing that I didn't really go into earlier. The other way that counsel is usually appointed in these cases is the Prosecuting Attorneys Council actually appoints it, and that's what happened in that case. Um, but they don't, they sometimes will pay an hourly rate if it's something that is needed, but in that case, he was actually the district attorney in another county. And that's what I've experienced before. So the two times I've had special counsel, it's been because it's somebody from outside in another jurisdiction that's brought in. So that's what happened in this case. But then he took, an, he took a job later. The other big difference with that case, and this came up in our oral arguments with the judge, that's a post-conviction case. The standard of review is very different post-trial than it is pre-trial. We're in a pre-trial posture. That, and we talked about that because the judge asked us a similar question um, about how to distinguish that. That's the big issue, and the judge pointed that out. That is post-trial. Post-trial, we have harmless error review. It's not a great review. So, you know, it's just like ineffective assistance of counsel. If you stop the harm before it happens, it's a different review than if you fix the harm after it's already done. It's really hard to overturn a conviction once the conviction happens, and that's what you have there. But in this case, they never got to the harmless error because the review because they said that no conflict existed. I understand what you're talking about by the harmless error, but they didn't never discuss that because no conflict existed. And you're right, it is post-conviction, but bottom line is you really did not address the, the aspects that I was talking about when they say well, is a conflict and it's not me putting this case in talking about a conflict it was the case that you guys actually did cite with yeah. that mr chair i yield well can i at least answer that question 
Sure you can. Um, we, we definitely cite it because um, we have, both myself and my husband, have a, a very strong policy of citing everything. We don't hide cases. So if there's something that's adverse to our position, we're going to cite it and we're going to explain it. We don't hide behind it. Um, so we cite, we cite adverse authority all the time. <laughs> adverse authority, but that's fine. Right. It, the you. oral arguments that we did, we actually, that was, the, that was how the oral arguments started. So. All right, so that uh, line of question deals specifically with the legal principles right. involved in your motion to disqualify. As I understand it, the, you're not really claiming a conflict of interest between defendants, et cetera. It's the conduct of the prosecutor. Yes. That yeah, there's is no conflict. Conduct. Yeah, we're okay. not talking about the conflict between defense and We're defendants. talking about the fact that um, the DA's office failed to follow state law and get an approval, failed to follow follow county uh, policies to get approval of her budget in this contract that he was not eligible to have been hired had he been disclosed because of you referred to it as nepotism but it's uh, relationships yes. with and your complaints are of uh, she's receiving a financial benefit of gifts of more than a hundred dollars which violate county policies yes county and state so the, and, and we attached that to, to one of the briefs um, her return where she filed it under oath that says okay. I mean it specifically says if you've got something over a hundred dollars you have to um, you have to disclose right. it and oh here it is it's um, so it's called the Fulton County income and financial disclosure report um, and that says and it says pursuant to section 2-79 of the Fulton County Code of Ethics um, that any Anytime you've got um, each gift or favor from a single prohibited source in the aggregate amount of $100 or more. And then it says, for s purposes of this section, gift and favors means anything of value given by or received from a prohibited source. Prohibited source means any person, business, or entity that the involved officer, so Ms. Willis, knows or should know um, is seeking official action or is seeking to do or do business, doing business with the county. Um, so obviously that would that would apply okay and uh, failing to respond to your open records request and potentially giving false testimony under oath if your version of facts is proven to be true yes okay um keep us posted i guess we'll keep reading the press as to how your case pro progresses I, I guess there um i'm troubled about this find the votes book are you saying that the prosecutor has been discussing an ongoing prosecution and her prosecutorial strategy and indictment strategy to authors of a book during the course of the prosecution? Yes. And yes. that book has now come out? It is. It's, I, it, I don't think I brought it with me. Um, no, I have I have a copy. We admitted a copy at the hearing. Um, no, it's, it's, it's out there. It was published. You is know. that a violation of ethical obligations in, in some way to be publicly discussing just like the public statements you made about the guilt of a defendant etc yes definitely and and we allege that and argued that as far as forensic misconduct um it's it's very surprising shocking and you know i don't know that there's a ton of cases on it um but that book um also, we talked about it somewhat in our hearing because it goes into a lot of details about the financial troubles that Ms. Willis had prior to becoming DA. Um, and so, you know, it talks about that a lot. Okay. Is she getting a financial benefit from that book? I Is don't know. Is she getting a royalty or a payment for having been a contributor to it? I have no idea. Okay. But I know her dad testified that he was interviewed for it. He came to the district attorney's office um, and was interviewed for it as well. And I think that was when her dad first learned that she had dated Mr. Wade, I think. But it may, I may yeah. be wrong. Or maybe that's the first time he, they met, something like that. All right. Well, thank you for your willingness to testify before us and uh, the documents you provided. We'll need some time to analyze and review those. And again, all committee members have access to those. Uh, at David Cook's office, he's got them literally locked up in a, in a room. Um, we are not making copies or disseminating those. I will review the documents in more detail, and I'll confer with you, Senator Jones, if you're able to. We might can agree on what should be kept confidential there. I was, I noticed some bank records and. Mm -hmm. Uh, things that I, if it were me being investigated, I probably wouldn't want it uh, divulged to the public. I don't think that's necessary for us to do to do our job here. Uh, I do appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, 
thank you all for making time to be here on our committee day. We'll keep you posted uh, for the meetings. The meeting is adjourned.